God. Greetings and salutations, friends, and all praise the Horned Rat. Master of the world below, Lord of Ruin, and he whose name is Thirteen. And whom, much to my shame, I realize I haven't made a lore video on. I don't know how this happened. I'm as non plus as you are. But in last week's Terror Invictus stream, Sad Wings Raging reminded me of this and asked if I couldn't make one for October. And you know what? That's a brilliant idea. So thank you very much, sir, for the reminder. And let's talk Ram Horned Rats, shall we? And as always, we shall begin at the beginning with the origins of the Horned Rat. For unlike many gods, he might actually have one. In fact, there are a few different interpretations, theories, or myths, really, about how exactly the Horned Rat and, in turn, the Skaven race were created. The most sterile and boring versions is simply that the Skaven are some form of beastman variant, some mutated spin-off. This is obviously and self-evidently nonsense. The beastmen aren't created the way they are because of some unruly mutation. They didn't happen upon their forms through simple accident. They are creatures of chaos itself, and their bestial appearance is intended, designed, to evoke fear in the manlings who surround their forests. An even more ludicrous notion is the idea that the entire Skaven race are merely just rats, mutated to an absurd degree by extended exposure to warpstone, the raw stuff of chaos. This theory does have its appeal, I admit, as it means the Skaven are merely just creatures, accidents, mishaps. A comfortable delusion for the furless things that occupy so much of the Skaven's rightful place in the world. For the truth, of course, is far more horrific. The fact is the Skaven are God's chosen creations. The one and the only real God. The Horned Rat, of course. And oh sure. There are pretenders to his throne, plenty of them in fact. Everything from the manlings of the Empire's pitiful martyr, or even the four to the north. But these are not true gods. They cannot be, for they are mere creations of the mortal mind. They exist as a simple mirror to reality. Reflections, nothing more, of base emotions and desires. A true god is not created by the imaginations of those infinitely lesser than himself. He is the one doing the creation, as we can clearly see in the Doom of Kavzar. This is an ancient Tilean poem, describing events that happened thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago before the current timeline of the Warhammer world. Shut up, it still exists. <laughs> and it describes a civilization that is rather unusual. A mix of men and dwarves living together in what is now the Blighted Marshes, what was then a part of sort of pseudo Tilea. It would be more correct to say that it exists where a portion of Tilea now does. As back then, there were not a whole lot of major human civilizations. Even Hekara had yet to go through its, uh, great tumultuous period, shall we say. And this far north, humans were curious creatures, 
about on the same level as the local wildlife. Fur-clad barbarians, by and large overlooked or at best humoured by the dwarves and the elves that lived in the area and ruled over it. Incidentally, this poem also takes place during the War of Vengeance as well. But before we get sidetracked too far, this mixed civilization had achieved tremendous success. The human population farmed the lands and provided bumper crops of food. Meanwhile, the dwarves dug deep as ever and provided fine quality stone for building both above and below ground. It was such a successful and major town that the two groups decided to get together and build an enormous monument to the gods as thanks for their tremendous good fortune. It would take the form of an enormous tower stretching all the way to the skies. It took millennia to build. The entire lifespan of dwarven master masons were expanded, and yet still the tower grew and grew and grew. Until simple physics eventually brought a halt to the construction. The tower had grown so impossibly tall that any further building appeared impossible. Even merely conveying material to the top was a lethally hazardous task, and many workers fell to their death from the dizzying heights. And yet, the centerpiece of the tower was not yet installed. Dwarves and men both had crafted a monumental bronze bell. It was unthinkable to finish the work before the crown jewel was in place, and yet lifting it all the way to the top seemed hopeless. And then, one day, a stranger arrived. A man hooded and cowled that claimed that he could finish the edifice, and all he asked in return was that he be allowed to write a dedication to the gods on the bell once it was in place. A preposterous statement, surely. The men and dwarves both had spent hundreds of years on this, and now this stranger arrives and claims that he'll get it done in a day. <laughs> and yet, well, he wasn't asking for much, and if he could somehow do it, then... What reason was there to complain? This was a time of legends, after all, of incredibly powerful wizards and remarkable feats of engineering. This was when the Dwarven Empire was at the height of their power, rivaled only by the High Elves, who controlled vast stretches of the earth. So if some stranger arrived one day and claimed to be able to do the impossible, this would be the age in which they just might. And so a deal was struck, and one single night later the masterpiece of engineering stood completed, with the bell affixed firmly at its very summit. Of the stranger there was no sign but presumably he had already taken his payment and left, seemingly uninterested in gazing upon his achievement. The populace of the city, however, were far more enthusiastic. Rushing towards the temple, they suddenly came up short, stopping in their footsteps as the great bell on the top began to ring. At first there was celebration. Not only was it mounted, it was fully installed and functional. The bell rang once and twice and thrice to cheers and jubilation in the town below. Four times, five times, six times. The din was now growing tremendous. Could a mere bronze bell create such reverberations? Seven, eight, nine. The very ground began to shake and crack open. People were bending over, clasping their hands to their ears to drown out the din. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and the entire tower cracked 
and splintered down the middle, sending showers of broken masonry scattering across the town, killing dozens, and yet miraculously, or perhaps that is not quite the correct word, the tower remained standing. No one could now climb it. It was far too unsafe. It might collapse at any moment. Reaching the bell seemed a fool's errand, and no one was quite so brave as to try. Especially as the skies themselves, just like the tower, cracked open and unleashed a deluge of strange, stinking black rain, cloying and choking. The survivors retreated to their houses, well-built, solid stone houses, and figured they would simply outlast the storm. Surely this was a, a freak incident, perhaps some um, after effect of the magic wrought to establish the towering monolith now seemingly leaning ominously over their proud city. But the rain didn't stop. The once fertile farmlands outside, covered in endless fields of wheat, grew heavy and dark, rotting or blackening. The fertility of the very land itself seemed under assault, as the rain clung to the crops. Some tried to leave, but despite its weird, sticky tendencies, the rain also seeped into the ground with unseemly ease, turning every road into a quagmire. Even a man on foot could barely struggle through knee-depth sucking mud that tore at legs and slipped boots from feet effortlessly. And anything heavier, beasts of burden, oxes, horses, carts, all sank irrecoverably into the filth. And the water, if such a word is applicable, seemed to get everywhere, sneaking its way in through even the tiniest of crevices, filling houses, infecting storehouses, and rendering food inedible. By the time the populace realized what was happening, any attempt to leave, much less a mass evacuation, was thoroughly unachievable. In the desperate situation, the populace turned towards the only source of salvation they could think of, their ancient dwarven allies. They lived beneath the ground in enormous cavernous halls. They had stored up as much, if not more, food supplies than the humans above ground, and they must be insulated against the water. They hadn't emerged from their dugout ever since the rains began, however. They had not offered aid, they had not offered food, they had not offered shelter. The officials of the town went to their gates and petitioned for entry, but no answer was forthcoming. Repeated petitions were made, and yet nothing. Their allies had abandoned them. Their dwarves had locked themselves in their caves and caverns, and were even now no doubt feasting on the hard-won food that the humans had grown. Angus quickly began to flare and rise, until the humans, now quickly running out of any further options, picked up what pitiful weapons they had, pitchforks and scythes, and chopped down the few trees that still remained alive to form battering rams with which to beat down the gates of the dwarven forts. And even when the boom, boom, boom of repeated impacts was sent shivering down the underground halls, no response came. No dwarven envoys emerged to ask what the hell the humans were doing. No bolts or quarrels let forth from massively concealed defensive positions. The humans slowly, very slowly, hammered down the gates smashing them off their hinges, and once they entered into what they would have presumed to be well-lit, sumptuous underground halls, they entered into darkness. Darkness and dust and desolation. Nervous now, 
Gripping pitchforks and improvised weaponry in sweaty hands, the humans pushed further down into the darkness, expecting at any moment to see lights, to hear something, to hear the sounds of the dwarves' pickaxes, which had so cheerfully reverberated through these halls mere months before. And now, nothing. When the humans finally did find something, it was not salvation. It was gates seemingly barred and yet broken open. It was rooms littered with debris and skeletal remains of broken axes, of torn armor and gnawed bones. So stunned were the humans that they did not even notice that the seeming eternal silence had finally been broken by the sounds of tiny, skittering claws on the rock, by chittering, and the impenetrable darkness all around them was now filled with millions of tiny, little, glittering, malicious red eyes reflected in the pitiful torchlight of the humans. As the new masters of Kavzar closed in all around them. And so ends the Tilean poem, also known as The Curse of Kavzar. And this may sound like a Mere fantasy, right? A, a silly superstition. It bears striking resemblances, for example, to certain Norskan myths, or even ones from other timelines, perhaps. Not to mention the strange interference of this man, wizard, traveling, mysterious individual. The eradication of an entire civilization overnight. The seemingly absurd cohabitation between dwarves and humans, bearing in mind again that humans at this point in the old world itself were little more than fur-clad barbarians. Not to mention that with the War of Vengeance raging nearby, you'd think the dwarves of Kavzar would have something better to do than to build the tower with their pets. The whole thing seems easy to disregard as a simple warning tale. Tilea, after all, is one of relatively few human nations that fully recognize and understand the glory of Skavendom and jealously fear the rightful masters of the over and underworld. But there exists a second version of the poem, not written in Telea, a poem that might actually be the original text from which the Telean poem itself drew inspiration. This one is written in Kazalid, the language of the dwarves, and is titled The Doom That Came to Kavzar. This is a far more reliable accounting, for the dwarves rarely make this sort of nonsense up. They tally every last grudge, and this is a particularly vast one. Furthermore, it also provides a more detailed description of events. In the Kazalid version, the rains did not come alone. They brought with them pestilence, storms and rats, which snuck into storehouses and devoured food, attacked people and animals. Anyone who attempted to leave could do so, but they would need to ride into a tempestuous storm, seemingly surrounding their town. Anyone who left never returned. No matter whom, no matter the size of the party, they were simply just swept up. In this tale, too, there were other, far more unnatural dangers as well. Plague descended upon the city of an unnatural variant. Fire fell from the very sky itself. Even the huddled masses of the populace were twisted 
Babies were born with strangely elongated appendages, with tufts of fur, or snout-like protrusions in their faces. In this tale, too, the humans turned to the dwarves for succor, and in this tale, too, they were refused. But the dwarven side of the story here is that they did not do so out of cruelty. They did so because they were not in any position to help anyone. Their own deep wells were tainted, their own food stores gnawed and reduced by vermin, and more poignant than all the other mentions of verminous intruders is that of rats the size and gait of men who seemingly streamed up from the forgotten depths beneath the dwarven holes and overran the dwarven defenders. They shut their gates to the humans not to keep them out, but to keep the Skaven in. And the humans themselves too were assaulted by the furred fiends. The dwarves opened their gates and the two ancient allies fought together to the death, back to back, in the ever-diminishing holdouts of the vast underground tunnels and forts of the dwarves, until finally the last Dawi fell next to the last man, to become food for the chittering horrors that now stalked the dark. Again, it would be simple to simply dismiss this as yet another fairy tale story, but for the mentions of the Skaven in particular, but for the mention of the stranger with seemingly unimaginable magical powers, but for the thirteen rings of the bell, but for the simple fact, of course, that this story perfectly represents the behavior and the ideology of the horned rat to turn friend upon friend, to gnaw away at civilization through means of subterfuge and infiltration, of terror and of slow, slow degradation. Now even I, a Skaven scholar as I am, admit that there is no truly firm evidence of any of this. How, after all, could the horned rat walk amongst us as a mere mortal, presuming he was any such thing? He clearly managed to present himself to the populace of this city in such a way that did not awaken any immediate fear or distrust, but... Surely such deception is a mere parlor trick to a god, right? And it's not like ascendancy is an unheard of thing. <laughs> How many thousands of Chaos champions head north every year hoping to be given just that very gift, to be raised up in the ranks of their pantheon? It may simply be that whomever or whatever the horned rat once was, was simply a far more ambitious champion, someone that did not wish to merely become some deity's tool, but had found some way to tap into the immaterium itself, through forgotten lore, through a ritual of incredible power, one that also, of course, needed a tremendous sacrifice, like, oh, I don't know, an entire city's population reduced to starvation and eventual predation? It sounds like a pretty good theory to me. Whatever the truth may be, the Horned Rat is here now, and he is most assuredly real. Many of the other gods in the warp, of course, occasionally hand down a sign of their divinity here and there, a sign of favor, a blessing mayhaps, mutations or a steed, magical weaponry maybe even. These are, obviously, yet again, the acts of false 
gods. The four to the north must buy their servants' loyalty with constant trinkets and little pieces of attention. The horned rat, on the other hand, need not bribe his followers. The entire Skaven race is absolutely, unquestionably convinced that the horned rat is real and that he watches them at every moment of every day forever. And if he is ever displeased, he'll let them know. And so it is not desire for trinkets that motivate the Skaven to worship the one and only true god. It is fear, a very real and tangible fear as well. Every Skaven will offer plentiful prayers to the Horned Rat every day he exists if he is wise. Granted, what constitutes a prayer to the Horned Rat can be somewhat a matter of interpretation. Cursing one's rival, that's a fine prayer indeed. Backstabbing one's master, a better one still. Slitting the throat of an undeserving competitor, fantastic. Devouring your own siblings, mere hours after being born, even this is an act of praise for the horned rat. Every act of deceit, every betrayal, every act of petty violence, every theft, all strife, all hunger, all ambition, are aspects of the Horned Rat. And so all the Skaven need do to avoid being devoured by his hunger is to carry out his will. Simple. And if they fail, well, the Horned Rat has eaten a lot of Skaven over the years. And he is going to be devouring a lot more before he is done. As his servants have proven frustratingly incompetent on more than one occasion. Initially, the Horned Rat gave his disciples fairly free reigns. He established a council of thirteen, the greatest of all his servants. The council's seats were open to anyone with the power to seize it, except of course for the thirteenth seat, which was the Horned Rat's own and most prestigious of all on the council. This august body was to lead the Skaven forward to a greater future, to final ascendancy, where the rule of the Horned Rat would subsume the world, and his favourite children would rule over the ruins. Unfortunately, some of the guiding principles of the Horned Rat proved counterproductive to this idea. The constant cycle of backstabbing, for example, has swept the legs from underneath the Skaven's attempt at world domination on a disturbing number of occasions so far. Worse still, the Skaven race has almost managed to exterminate itself on at least three separate instances. The first was when they were trying to expand upon the tunnels beneath Skaven Blight to house their ever-exploding population numbers, which resulted in an explosion of a different kind. The detonation of a tremendous experimental device right beneath the capital, collapsing much of the tunnels and killing millions of little ratmen. The second near apocalypse came at the end of the first great Skaven civil war. I stress the word great there because the Skaven race is in essence always in a state of civil war. Only the scale changes. But this one was caused by the re-emergence of Clan Pestilence, who had created a power structure across the seas in Lustria, 
They had waged quite the significant conflict against the Council of Thirteen. The clan pestilence had only been brought to the negotiation table, quote unquote, by the re-emergence of another clan, Eshin, who had sided with the council and begun assassinating a disturbing number of clan pestilence personnel. Now, it's not normally within the nature or the habit of the council to pardon a defeated and weakened foe. But Clan Pestilence envoy to the Council of Thirteen, after having survived thrice daily attempts on his life every single leg of the journey, made a persuasive argument to the Council. Clan Pestilence would place all of their might and resources at the Council's disposal. And should they still elect to reject this generous overture of cooperation, then Lord Nurglicht also informed them that he was carrying the virological equivalent of a thermonuclear device beneath his robes. And that any further attempts to liberate his spirit from his body would result in its immediate detonation. The third brush with annihilation came some time after in the Second Great Skaven Civil War. The kickoff for this conflict was in many ways similar to the first, in that it was Clan Pestilence who was, in this case, blamed rather than directly responsible. The failure of the Red Pox to fully subdue Britonia meant that Clan Pestilence had a weakened position in Skaven politics. And that is not a position that any Skaven <laughs> maintains for long, without either rectifying the situation or finding themselves the victims of their peers. In this case, Clan Pestilence were not easy prey, despite their relative weakness, and so put up a fierce fight against the Council of Thirteen, which in turn actually meant that the Council itself found itself rather vulnerable and so many upstart clans saw this as a lovely opportunity to further their own position. And in this instance, the council could not keep exclusive control over Clan Eschen, who had in essence served as the council's shadowy enforcers, and they couldn't keep control for the simple reason that there was no unified council. This wasn't a question of the Council versus Clan Eshin, this was a question of every clan for itself. A situation where alliances were as fleeting as they were common. And so Eshin simply saw their services to the highest bidder, as did Clan Pestilence, as did Clan Scryer, and so of course, as did Clan Mulder. The Second Skaven Civil War, then, was a flare-up of the usual continuous small-scale warfare activities, where pretty much every single clan would attempt to rise to power in one way or another, as the major clan supported their preferred competitors, or simply those with enough warp tokens to purchase their supports. Though the major clans' positions as well quickly saw themselves undermined as some upstart clans gained a little bit more power than anyone had really counted on. And so the war continued, and continued, and continued, and continued, for 400 years, with no victor in sight. In fact, no one was even remotely close. Every time one clan, one faction, one alliance managed to claw itself ahead, all the others would unite against them with ferocious single-mindedness and drag them back down into the mud again, only for the large alliance to splinter next to immediately upon defeating their shared foe. Now again, a little bit of discourse was hardly a rarity amongst the Skaven race, but this was getting ridiculous. And what was worse is that 
several of the factions had essentially evolved into their own separate organizations. They were beginning to build their own councils, their own structures of command and governance, if for no other reason than due to simple necessity. The Skaven race was fracturing, and it had to be stopped. If the Great Horned Rat's ultimate victory was to be achieved, then his offspring really needed to stop arguing, at least with this vehemency. And so, the Grey Seers, the Horned Rat's favored magic users, and the de facto priestly class of the Under Empire all got together to plan a nearly unique ritual of tremendous power and no small risk to Skaven kind. They would, through the sacrifice of 169 prime quality slaves, call forth the Horned Rat himself and allow him to manifest, however briefly, in the real world. But such a grand display of force and authority, of course, could not be allowed to pass without an audience. The Grey Seers thus set out from Skaven Blight to visit every borough, every clan chief, every leader, every representative of every power block, and demand, not invite, mind you, demand that all of them show up to Skaven Blight for the yearly Feast of Vermintide where they would come face to face with their god. Now, this was hardly the first time that some force or another in Skaven society had used an invitation to a banquet or peace negotiations or festivities as a ruse to entice their enemies onto a hostile ground. But in this case, the Gracias themselves were the direct sponsors of it. Throughout the Civil War, the Gracias had served as sort of pseudo-diplomats and envoys, as very few Skaven dared lay a paw upon their pristine grey fur, a sign of special favour from the Horned Rat. Thus, they could travel far more safely than any other of the rat mankind. When they issued an invitation, especially one on behalf of the horned rat, it was very difficult to refuse. And many, although tempted to do just that, no doubt, were even more worried about the consequences that a refusal might have. And so, when the Feast of Vermintine rolled around, the city of Skaven Blight was full to bursting, even more so than usual, that is, with all the greats and luminaries of the Under Empire gathered in one spot. Those few who had elected to not show up out of simple fear, had instead sent enormous delegations, laden down with bribes, or gifts. The word has no distinction really in the Skaven language to dilute any offence taken by their absence. Then, shortly before midnight, the great ritual could begin. Thirteen times thirteen slaves would be sacrificed in a growing crescendo of agony and torture, with the very last slave being executed by Seer Lord Kritzlik personally. And the Seer Lord very nearly came to regret his actions near immediately, as his flesh became host to the Great Horned One whose malice could not be contained within such a meagre vessel, and so began to flow forth from every orifice of the Seer Lord, coiling further up into the heavens around the great sacred tower, until finally a rent in reality was sliced open by one titanic claw, revealing the divine presence 
of the horned rat. As one, the near entirety of Skavendom fell to their knees, whimpering, begging, pleading, and squirting the musk of fear, hoping that it would please their lord and master. And it did. The great horned rat reached down one titanic paw to scoop up hundreds of Skaven and deposit them screaming into his jaws. He did this again and again and again, blessing his children by taking them within his flesh, whether they considered it a blessing or not. No one truly knows how many Skaven died that day, or, I'm sorry, were uplifted that day, because frankly, no other Skaven felt the need to keep count. They were just happy that they were not amongst the Chosen. But just as it seemed the Horned Rat would simply continue to devour all his children, he paused. As the great claw retracted one final time, it revealed a black pillar, which instantly came to light in glowing green runes. It seemed to have been carved from solid warpstone, infused with the essence of a god. With a voice like the tolling of a million cracked bells, the Lord of Decay pronounced that whilst his offspring's bickering amused him, it was time to set aside at least some of their differences and unite finally to commit to the Great Ascension, the Horned One's plan for his children to rule over the world. And it was important they began to move now, for the false gods, the four in the north, had anointed their own champion, Azavar Kul, to sweep down from the north to subjugate all the races of the world. This could not be allowed to happen, for it was the horned rat's privilege to subsume the globe not that of the four false gods. But for all their preening insignificance, the Chaos Powers did have an advantage in organization. <laughs> there are very few factions that look upon the forces of Chaos and think discipline, but the Skaven are one of them. And thus, the Great Horned One had some ground rules. The thirteen sides of the Black Pillar had thirteen blocks of thirteen commandments, 169 in total, thirteen times thirteen. These were the laws of the Lord of Decay. These were the rules by which Skaven society should be governed. These were the rules by which every Skaven should live and breathe, and only those who could touch the pillar and live would be allowed on the Council of Thirteen. This was a rather radical departure from how things had been previously, where anyone, so long as they could kill a seat's previous occupant, could claim a position on the council, whereas now, first, any would-be aspirants would have to touch the pillar and then depose a sitting lord. This change in rule also reinforced the council's authority, as the horned rat promised that anyone who could touch the pillar and live would be richly rewarded. With his final commandment thus delivered, the Horned Rat slipped once more into the realm of ruin, and left his children to bicker. The very first who touched the pillar was transformed into a screaming, squealing pillar of grain and black flames that burned for a very long time. After that, the numbers of willing applicants dropped sharply. 
until only the most ambitious, cunning and clever of Skaven remained to try their luck with the Pillar of Commandments. And finally, after thousands had burned, the council re-emerged, a full twelve strong, with as always the thirteenth seat reserved for the Horned Rat. Each one of the new councillors was blessed now too with his personal aura, boasting their own powers and granting them longevity quite beyond the wildest dream of any Skaven, who by and large would be lucky to see thirty. With their authority now reinforced, the council could bring the various clans and their bickering to an end. At least to some degree. Theoretically, technically, ideally. The Council of Thirteen should keep themselves separate and far above the politics of Skavendom, only stepping in when absolutely necessary to quash rivalries that have gone a little bit too far. For after all, a bit of backstabbing, a bit of betrayal, a bit of rivalry, a bit of internal disputes here and there, could only serve to strengthen the Horned Rat's chosen people. And, well, the thirteen times thirteen commandments extolled the virtues of clever betrayal, even as it condemned it. The commandment stated, clear as clear, that it was every Skaven's duty to make sure that no incompetent overlord be allowed to sit easy on a pretty throne, even as the commandments also ordered all Skavens to show undying fealty to those above them. It uh, was a pinch confusing, really and those who read the commandments in depth, hoping to find some clever way of abusing them for their own power, quickly realized that their intellect was as nothing compared to the endless wisdom of he who dwells beyond the veil. For every rule there was an exception, for every commandment there was an excuse, for every betrayal a rationale. But despite the incredibly convoluted and complex nature of the commandments to his most favoured servants, it was all crystal clear. If you do something wrong and get away with it, you have done nothing wrong. In fact, you have done the only correct thing. If, however, you get caught, then you are guilty of that most egregious of all crimes, incompetence. And there are no ignoramuses on the council. It is therefore accepted that the favour of council members can be leased out for a time, providing sufficient Offerings are granted unto the horned rats chosen, of course, and this too is perfectly acceptable, to a degree, mind you. The sovereign of all rodent kind has no problems with his favoured, making sure that they get a good slice of the pie, of course, so long as their greed does not get in the way of the grander design. See Lord Kritzlik, the very same one that had summoned the Horned Rats so long ago, fell foul of this most basic of commandments much later on in his career, where his undue and overdone favour of Clan Scruton landed him in the paws of the Horned One. His fellow council members had all blamed Kitzlik, you see, for the failure of their recent intrigues, and thus isolated by all the other council members, regardless of any actual fault in the matter, the Horned Rat elected to make an example out of Kitzlik, by devouring him oh so delectably in front of all the others. For whilst, of course, the Skaven are that most loyal of all species, that most correct of all races, 
they do occasionally require a gentle reminder of their place in the grand scheme of things. For the time is now finally approaching. The horned rat has been gnawing at the roots of the world for thousands of years, plotting, scheming, placing his pieces ready to be moved. And now, as the winds of chaos grow stronger in the north yet again, there is an opportunity at hand. The four false gods will weaken the realms of men yet again. And this time, Skavendom is united. It is not riven by internal dispute by a 400 year civil war. It is strong, it is gathered, and it is of singular purpose. At long last, a dawn is coming. The dawn of Ratkind's dominion over all that rightfully belongs to the Horned Rats. There will be no stopping the Great Ascendancy now. Unless, of course, his servants should prove to be, yet again, less than desirable. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching. And I do hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.